So welcome to this uh, third um, workshop where I actually um, to do something different, not completely different, but today it's about contradiction. The um, saying from Nietzsche, contradictions are signs of um, health, everything absolute is the pathology. Yeah? And as I um, spoke about all this kind of contradiction, hypothesis is that the farther away the little story is from the grand narrative, the more inconsistencies there are. Yeah? So that, that's idea, but what, we, uh, want, what I want to talk about today is um, two things, a methodological um, reasoning and then it's something new and because of the questions that arose uh, last time about the family narratives that Pierre said, the like in-between narratives and then I was really thinking this dualistic approach, this categorical approach of grounds and little stories, it's, it's not good enough. So I have an, an additional perspective. Something that Stefan uh, brought up um, when he said, I don't see actually the connection between this narrative thing and prevention. So there is a lot about prevention and mental health in the talk. And also uh, I uh, give my text to um, a colleague in Ghent, uh, Chris Rutten, and he's really into rhetorics. And so he has comments and I put them together in the talk of today. And so I hope that Stefan will <laughs> see it uh, in the online version. So I, I want to focus on the story of life versus the story of research, something going on between doing life, talking life, and then doing research, research. That's the first part of the talk. And the second was then beyond binaries, perspectives on perspectives, how we can put in perspectives on perspectives. And that I will illustrate with two studies we did on mental health coverage in uh, media in six European countries and all the different perspectives that you have on mental health and whether they are uh, stigmatizing or positive and you will see that no single narrative is absolutely stigmatizing or absolutely positive so it's a quite complex thing and it learns something about going on with going yeah studying bi binaries or beyond binaries so first, the methodology. Like I said, I think that um, family, talking family on the one side and doing research, uh, qualitative as well as quantitative, I have some questions about that, about what we do and how we study that. Little stories always appear in interaction, yeah? But we as the researchers, we are not in that interaction, yeah? It appears, and I want to give two examples, and I will then elaborate on these examples in research. The first is um, a friend of mine, and uh, Jan also knows her, um, got a wedding proposal on the Mont Ventoux. You know the Mont Ventoux in France, yeah? And when she talks about it, and that's the second thing actually, that is talking research, when she presents the story, it's a discourse on the story, yeah. Then she presents this very romantic thing. What they did is the Mont Ventoux for them because that was a, their first uh, holiday was on the Mont Ventoux. And then they did it on a tandem bike, so as a couple. Yeah. And she didn't know that he wanted to propose. Yeah. So at the top, when they both in this very meaningful place with a tandem bike went to the top, there he kneeled down and did the wedding proposal. But the story as it goes between them is very strange because they were there for a week and the weather was really bad. And they couldn't just go onto the mountain because the weather was too bad. That, that will kind of disappear in the, in the story. So if we are interested in inconsistencies, because we are interested in, yeah, that they are meaningful stories, we want to capture them, then if we have like quality, the, what we get is a reflection, is a discourse. What you get as a researcher is always a discourse, it's always a reflection, it's always a narrative, and it kind of reflects what is going on in life, but it's not really similar yet. So I think it's a real problem of studying uh, talking family, talking family, doing gender, talking 
doing life. Yeah? Another example that I want to, we did some research on, is if you ask oh, who decides in the family what you're going to eat. Everyone says mothers. Mothers cook, they make and fathers go to the shop, and then the fathers buy what the mothers say they have to cook. If you try to get your child uh, having Brussels sprouts, yeah, then it's, a, it's like an evening consuming uh, activity. Yeah? Whereas if you give them applesauce, it just very smoothly. If you do multiple family members interviews, you get inconsistencies. Yeah? But even think about um, the people who are environmentally um, uh, conscious eh, and smoke or go on holidays and take the plane 10 times a year, four times a year. <laughs> um, <laughs> this is an inconsistency within a person, yeah? And it's a, a clear inconsistency, yeah? It's, it's uh, someone says, I'm a humanist, and he's a trader also. So it's, it can be an inconsistency. So sometimes how we behave, present ourselves, our identity and our behavior are inconsistent. That's why I wanted to, the, the second part I want to spend on the rhetoric and the perspectives on perspectives, because I don't think we have to see cons inconsistencies as binary things that are opposite to one another and it's either or. You're not either environmentally conscious or um, plain. Yeah? You can take the plane for other reasons. Yeah? Um, but it's still, I think, the thing is, how do you capture inconsistencies? And I agree, if you have multiple members telling about the same event, it's absolutely a way of getting inconsistencies. Yeah? The only thing here I think I wanted to make is, if you ask people to reflect or for a story, they will present in a way, and then, uh, have, like you said, uh, it's for my kids because I can spend time in my family. And these are constructions, post hoc constructions that are relevant, of course, uh, but that, that are reflective and discursive. Uh, and that might be different from what really happens. And then I think there is even another thing going on. If, we, if you, for instance, use a questionnaire, yeah? Because then you, ha you have same, these are post hoc constructions, reflective, people want to present themselves in a rational, logical way. But what you then will, will get is, for instance, like scales with low Kronberg alpha of consistent correlation patterns of, or null results. And these are typical things that we leave out. Yeah? So I think it's just making the point that if inconsistencies, if we value them, if we think they are important to study, then we really have to think about how can we study them, yeah? And of course, the, the, the first thing is more close to like anthropology or autoethnography of ethnography. And so that was just the first part. The second part I wanted to do is the more rhetoric part. And this is something, yeah, I think new. Rhetorics is a field of study, uh, you, you might know, concerned with how people arrive at understanding through the use of symbols and language, the, the use of narratives, we would say. It's very close to the narrative turn, the rhetoric turn, and the narrative turn. Eh? And also how people persuade to actions and beliefs, like you say, I persuade myself to take the plane because of my kids. Yeah? It's a, a persuasion. You use arguments, you use narratives, you use logics and understandings to get the point. Yeah? So that's rhetoric as a, a discipline. Yeah? So the, the thing about rhetorics is that you try to understand all kind of perspectives from the same phenomenon. Consistencies like the, the humanist trader or the uh, environmentally conscious smoker or whatever, eh? um, we're still thinking about inconsistencies in terms of binaries, yeah? dualistic thinking, yeah? the, the opposites. Yeah? The more perspectives we have, the better. Yeah? Instead of trying to solve the problem of being an environmentally conscious plane taker, yeah? you try to have even more perspectives on this, yeah? And it's not about having um, 
like defending all the all the different perspectives on, on one thing. Yeah. And that's a way of getting out of this binary holistic thinking. Yeah. And so we did that on mental health, and that's what I want to tell you about. So the, the ideas that like we had the little stories, the grand narratives, the family narratives that Pierre uh, brought up last time, these are all different perspectives because in my inaugural talk somewhere, and it's all, um, it's on another slide, but it's if you have opposites, grand narrative, little story, there's always one that is better than the other, even implicitly, yeah? Like, I think the little stories, the, the grand narratives, they have something bad in them because they are oppressive, yeah? They are also, they are not only oppressive yeah? because uh, for us, for instance, the idea, the grand narrative, it takes a village to raise a child, yeah? Can be very liberating, but if you live somewhere in a culture where this is the grand narrative, then probably people there can tell you how oppressive this nor, nor, uh, narrative can be for them, yeah? So, but every time you have like binary thinking, like male, female, science, art, you know, all these things, there's all but body, soul, there's always like one part that is implicitly or explicitly better. Yeah. Okay, so we were, this is like um, a way of overcoming the uh, dualistic binary thinking. Yeah. And um, the idea is that no single perspective can bring everything together. Yeah? No, no single little story can have everything. No. And also, I think in narrative therapy, they say the more um, stories you can tell about yourself, the better. Yeah? All the kind of perspectives. Uh, sometimes you can be just um, uh, say, when I'm, I'm a successful woman, but that can be very oppressive too. Yeah? But if you can say, I'm, a, um, I'm a, successful woman, but I'm also a mother, and I'm also anxious of this and this and this, and I'm also yeah, scared of and, 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 and have a hard time with, and so all the kind of uh, practice you can have in yourself. The idea is also that this is like an unending conversation, and uh, again, like the factors that um, uh, we mentioned last time, or the question of Stefan for the, the relevant question he said last time, I really can't see how this, what you say about the grand narratives and the stories, how, how relevant it is for prevention. So I, that is what, what I wanted to persuade him to do <laughs> today, yeah, to use rhetoric for that. Yeah. And it's a response to dualistic of categorical thinking, of categorical thinking. Now the, the binary dualistic categorical thinking is really hard to avoid, even because I see myself as an categorical thinker and uh, especially in the methods, I, I told you about that. I, I always refuse to compare families with other families. So, um, but still, it's um, it's something that is very natural for us, yeah, to think in male, female, art, science, uh, alpha, beta, um, body, soul, qualitative, quantitative research, yeah, grand narrative, little story. So it's something that we. Um, often do, and uh, how we, we structure the world. And uh, like I said, when, when we do that, there's always one of the poles that is more dominant or better or whatever, yeah? And so rhetorics really want to break this open and to say, if you have five perspectives instead of two, it will be much better, yeah? And don't, do not try to say this is a better perspective than that, but just to broaden your scope and have more different perspectives. So how to deal with this binaries? Snow says the drawback of the binary thinking is the number two. Yeah? That's what we are saying. Uh, it's the, 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 the second part, which is the, the lesser part. And so, for instance, the, some dialectic processes we have to be cautious about because um, if you want to make a compromise or, or um, choose between one of the two bi binaries, that's not really what rhetorics wants, yeah? That's, they want to really more open the scope. So we have to question the validity of the binaries and then uh, because they all create like a correct, uh, um, caricature of the debate uh, that is far more complex than two sides. Peter Elbow has written something about 
that and he said there are five ways of um, dealing with binaries. The first is obvious, that is uh, choose one side. The, so this is uh, one thing, it's the either or. Um, it's um, yeah, closely linked also to need of closure and some people really want to have it very straightforward and, and, and choose one of the parties uh, to, um, to combine with uh, fake, fake news and postmodernism and uh, pseudoscience and things like that. Because of course, if you have such a perspective, then you would say that pseudoscience would be on the same track as science and that fake news would be on the same track of new truth and, and, and in, in this debate also, yeah. Um, at least, yeah, it, it's sometimes, um, especially in psychology, when we had all these problems with people making up uh, results and things like that, yeah, we had this question about real signs and, and uh, if you come up with these kind of things, then people some, sometimes say, also in the Trump period and now with like the Ukrainian-Russian thing and, and so, so it's, it's sometimes very difficult to also do this, especially in these cases where you do have one that is more true than another. Yeah, because e here you go, you start from the assumption that things are equally true, yeah, which is not always the case, of course. Yeah, so that's the basic assumption here. Yeah. So the second thing you can do is work out a compromise or a dialectical syn synthesis. Um, you can also deny that there is a, any contradiction. But then the two ways of, uh, that are more rhetorical is affirm both sides uh, of the dichotomy as equally true. So here it is equally true, so that's really important. We're not uh, talking about fake news. Um, and that's why my colleague always says when he has a lecture or whatever, am I for or am I against? Yeah, because I can take both sides. I can have other sides, like uh, interesting talks about, I don't, I don't know how you call it in, um, in English or in uh, French, but the, uh, the coverage of the hair of women wearing, um, how, do, how does it, how do you call it, hoofdoek? Um, Yeah, you know what I mean? Like the, the Muslim woman, yeah, so there was a whole debate in public settings. In Flanders, there was a whole debate in public settings. Do you allow them or not? Do you for, uh, is it forbidden or not? Yeah, and so you can easily take uh, a lot of arguments before, uh, for and against it, yeah? So he would say if, if they start such an argument, am I for or against? Just tell me and then I will defend it, yeah? So you affirm both sides. Yeah. And the other one is you reframe the contradiction so that there are more than two sides. And that's actually what, what the aim is. Yeah? And this, this is something that we um, did uh, a few studies with our students with to, to ask them to have more than one than the two sides. Albo says, as long, just as long as there's more than one, it's, it's okay. Yeah? If, if you can see three or five sides, that's good. So long that there is... A multi and actually in... Um, um, Ghent University, it's in our mission, uh, it's a very strange word, but it's multi-perspectivism. So, yeah, you can understand what it is. I don't know whether it's a real world, word, but and the, it's, it's hard because it's a very strange word, but it's hard to find another word for it. But that's really this, yeah, that we want our students to have multiple perspectives on the same um, kind of issues or problems. So not to have pairs, but to, the, to go away from simple single truth, to have situation of balance, irresolution, non-disclosure, non consensus non-winning, and here uh, the um, uh, affirming both sides, even when they are contradictory. So if we are about contradictions today, even when they're contradictory, they can exist next to one another. You can be environmentally conscious and take the play. Yeah. One of the big names in um, rhetorical perspective is Kenneth, Kenneth Burke. And there's a real Burke society, and it's very uh, big in uh, Ghent University. And uh, 
the, the thing that is actually also in the mission of Ghent University is this one sentence, every way of seeing is also a way of not seeing. And this is really important because it's not only about seeing a lot of perspectives, it's about being aware that if you take one perspective, you see a lot of things, but you also see, a, uh, you don't see a lot of things, yeah? And that's uh, the study I will send you in a minute is about the trained incapacities we have. Because we are trained as a psychologist, as, a tra as an educational scientist, as a prevention worker or whatever, as a teacher, you are trained in a way, and because you are trained, you see things. Yeah, it's a perspective. But also because of that, you don't see things. Yeah? And it's really important to be aware of incapacities. And it's, it's a, a bit the other way around, because we, we evaluate students on what, what their trained capacities are. But here we had a course, I had a course with this colleagues, where we evaluated the students on the, the, way, the, the, the degree to which they were aware of their trained incapacities. Uh, yeah? So it's, it's a, another way of, uh, of looking. So it's a thing as a pair of glasses through which you see things, but also fail to see things. So this every way of seeing is also a way of not seeing. It's like a, a phrase that we use all the time. Um, and um, so Chris Rutten and Ronald Sutter already mentioned, but Laura van Beveren, she is the one, is, was a doctoral student, and she's still working at, uh, at Ghent University. And uh, we did two studies together with the other ones also, and so these are the two studies that I wanted to present. So rhetoric is about installing a conversation, um, and, and you, you don't want to convince the other or yourself, but you want to broaden the discussion. Yeah? Um, you, you, you put on as much glasses as you can. Yeah? You say, oh, if, if I'm too much convinced of a certain story, I'll try to, to give counter arguments and, and see it another way, yeah? Okay, Burke uses a term, a terministic screen, and we also used it in the, but I do think that you can also just uh, use the term narrative, because a terministic screen is a way we select symbols, the language, the discourse, we um, uh, select to frame a reality, yeah? It's the way you use language to, to give your perspective, yeah? Uh, this, is a, this is a particular screen, and it's a particular way of thinking and acting, uh, um, and this trained in capacities, yeah? A terministic screen, one narrative, is a way of seeing, it helps you to be in the world, because we, uh, the, the things we know about our world, how we inter interpret the world, how we see the world, it helps us really to, to be here. Yeah? The, the way we understand this kind of class, it helps us to, to be here and to understand it and to, to relate to one another. Yeah? But it's also a trained incapacity. Yeah? And we did it, I don't know where, where you, whether you know the film Educating Rita. You know the film Educating Rita? It's about this um, Cambridge-like university, and there was um, this girl with a very short skirt and very high heels, and she comes on this cobblestones, yeah? And she, is, she wants to enroll as a student, and so there's this professor, the real professor, and she's a professor, and he says, your name, and she says, Rita, and yours? And she, she does all, the, all the, the, the things that you shouldn't do in this context because she isn't socialized in this kind of academic uh, narrative, yeah? And she, she's very strange, she's very, with lots of makeup and, and <laughs> all kinds of things. And then she goes behind uh, the, the professor and, and looks at his screen. What, what is he all... Uh, um, uh, typing about her, she wants to see, which is very normal actually, that if someone keeps a record from you that you want to see what it is, yeah? But it's very strange. Like, uh, the, so the whole film is about um, how we are all so socialized in this academic world, yeah? And if, so, if you look from, uh, from a completely different perspective to that, you get the strangest situations, yeah? Which are very normal for her, but are very uh, absurd for us, yeah? And so 
in a lot of situations, we are not aware how privileged we are or how socialized we are in all kinds of... Uh, um, we, the thing that we often... Um, what, what if when people say, oh, you have three months of holidays. Yeah, that's a classic one. Eh? If, uh, because the university is closed between July, August, and September. And they say, that because people see, yeah, if the university is closed, or the students are not here, then you have a holiday. Yeah, and things like that. But there are lots and lots of things that, that we don't realize, actually, how we are socialized, and not. Yeah? OK. So trained incapacities is... Uh, it's especially interesting to see what our trained incapacities are as researchers, as practitioners, as psychologists, therapists, prevention workers, teachers, and things like that. So these are the two studies. I just included this one because if you want to uh, have a more um, close look at them, um, you, can, you can look them up. Huh? I can also send you a copy if you want. The first study is the 2022 study uh, from Laura's uh, doctoral uh, PhD, and this is the trained incapacity of psychology students. So what we did is um, the psychology and psychiatry has have uh, grand narratives like the DSM, yeah, and the, the way we label people and things like that. It's it's a powerful way to look at. Um, um, psychology or psychiatric diseases, yeah, or, or patients. But of course, there are a lot of trained incapacities, yeah? And um, what we really wanted them to see is that this is an instrument in the cultural construction of what is mentally uh, normal and mentally ill or, or abnormal, and like we did it with the, the families. Remember, maybe my in in inaugural lecture where I said that we didn't want to compare families with normal families, because what is a normal family, yeah? It's, uh, so here also, you have people who are not normal, mentally ill, yeah? And so the, this is a construction of what is mental ill, yeah? And so we did two things. The first thing is here, we, um, with psychology students, and the second thing is, in six different European countries, we had all the newspaper coverages in two weeks, and we coded them in kind, what kind of discourses, narratives they use to refer to mental illness. Yeah. If you want to pause, you just say yeah. So the aim was to teach our college students to become critically aware of the different cultural assumptions or the logics in which patients and psychologists' narratives and interactions in relation to mental health are grounded. So what are the grand narratives? Yeah. And then to reflexively account for the power imbalances that, these, that go with these narratives and to get a plurality of perspectives, yeah? to get different perspectives. And how we did that is through a little story. And uh, I think is that the, with the little stories, we talk back to the grand narratives. Yeah? It's talking back. Yeah? It's, it's, it's putting something. And the little story is, um, a graphic novel of an author, and she is uh, a bipolar um, queer female artist. Yeah, and she made this very nice graphic novel. So we asked all the students to read this novel and then to reflect this little how this little story talks back to the grand narratives that they are trained in and to see their own trained incapacities. And so to analyze the construction of the mental health in this little story. Yeah. And we had 68 psychology students who did the assignment, and we had their reports so we could uh, get some results from that. Yeah. We did the analysis in two steps, or Laura did the analysis in two steps. First, the insight from rhetorical theory, and then uh, more detailed coding um, in the categories. And the first, the other, the self and society, I will come to that in a moment. Um, what are the main results, or some results, because there are lots of results. And actually, the students loved it, yeah? And this is a graphic novel, but they could choose between a graphic novel and a game. 
and that the game is also about depression and is also made by someone with depression. And the game is about how it is to live as someone with a depression. Yeah. So it's also the references are in the in the paper. So if you are interested, because it's uh, it both are in English. So it's uh, really nice actually because it relates to what I said in the beginning to the methodology. Yeah. They give insight in their own uh, living with bipolar depression or uh, or with depression. Yeah. So one of the things that they say is that um, the uh, main character, Ellen, she uh, tells about how she sometimes resists taking medical treatment or how she, she sometimes hides from her psychiatrist that she smokes weed. Yeah. And she explains why she does that. And one of the things that the students really picked is that this is like a difficult patient. If, if you are on the therapist side, on the psychology side, psychologist side, it's a difficult one, yeah? Because they are not um, uh, taking their pills like they should, yeah? They're taking drugs in between, yeah? So they're like messing, messing up the treatment, yeah? So not only difficult, but also dishonest, yeah? Because she hides it from the therapist, yeah? So from the therapist, from the, from the, from the trained side, yeah? This is something like, oh, yeah? For her, it's a very logic thing because she is an artist, she's creative, and she needs the kind of messing up in her head to be creative, or that's her story, yeah? That she needs it, yeah? So sometimes she doesn't take the pills because she's in a rush and she wants to, to create. And if she takes the pills, then she will be flat and, and not creative anymore. So, so it's very logical for her, but it's, for him, it's very difficult. Another thing is, if we ask them to do the rhetorical analysis, and this is really interesting, Almost all the students did what we call othering. Othering is that they saw the perspective of Ellen, the main character. They saw, they could really see how she um, lives with this medication and the drugs and the things and the creative parts and how being creative is her little story talking back to the manic depressive psychosis, yeah? That, that they could see all of them, yeah? And how difficult it is as a psychologist to, to look further than the dishonesty or the difficulty of being such a patient, yeah. So that's like the, the, the basic part of the rhetoric. Another thing is what we call rhetoric listening. That is, the therapist is not, is not a character that speaks, uh, the, 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 the novel is not written by the therapist, but the therapist is also a character, yeah. So you don't get it from first hand, but you get the therapist through the author, yeah? And so if you listen rhetorically, you can also grab something about the perspective of the therapist, yeah? The therapist having a difficult time with this patient that doesn't understand it, tries another method, is doing different things, doesn't get really a grip on the patient, yeah? So some of the students also did the rhetorical analysis of the therapist, yeah, which is what we call rhetorical listening because it's different from othering. Othering is just Ellen who says it, yeah, she's the author, she's, she talks about herself. Another level, which was very um, uh, nice and lots of things we got here, was what we call self rhetoric, that students reflected on their own being and capacities and training, yeah? Like they said that there were, um, for instance, a lot about the DSM, yeah? And how, how what, what the labeling does, yeah? But also a lot, in, and that's maybe a specific thing in Ghent, but in, in Ghent, they, had, they get a course on systemic therapy, they get a course on behavioral therapy, they get a course on, uh, on psychoanalysis, so they have all these different therapeutic uh, frameworks. Is it here the same? Do they have them, or do they have them together? <laughs> to be as empirically based as possible, but uh, of course, different perspectives of this more all together is less compartmentalized. Yeah, but I think we are, 
it's, it's really a gun situation, eh? that it's all, that's, there, there's one core psychoanalysis, and it's old fashioned, it's old -fashioned yeah. And then they get the method, they, they get the, the model, they get the assessment and the therapy of psychoanalysis. Then there's the systemic therapy. They get the model, the assessment, and the therapy of systemic. Then they have the behavioral and, and the cognitive behavior. And Marine? What year were those students in? First master. And it was actually the cor my course of family therapy. But uh, the course was, I think it was not very relevant that it was a family therapy course, but it was in that course in the first master. So they talked a lot about how these different therapeutic frameworks and how they were trained in that, how that relate to the, because the, the, the novel doesn't really tackle one of the therapeutic um, directions, yeah? And uh, so they were wondering, what do we do with all this knowledge about all these different things? Huh? Also, the difference between psychiatrists and psychologists, lots of thoughts there. Um, and th a lot of them said that they never thought about uh, bipolar psychosis as um, being creative, yeah? This, so, uh, that, that for Ellen is really the way her talking back, yeah? And that was really like an eye-opener. Um, so this is self-rhetoric thing, and then there are also social reflections, um, yeah, about agency, this is how scientific knowledge and uh, education are agentic, yeah, how you as a psychologist or psychiatrist get some agency from your training, um, that you're an expert in the therapeutic space, yeah, and how you deal with that, yeah, and how this becomes clear from reading such a novel. Um, the students also confront the, uh, the grand narrative with the counter narratives, and they, they, they had several grand narratives, like, and also we are our abilities and what we do with them. Yeah? Not only our abilities, but especially what you do with them. The kind of self entrepreneurship that is in this. Yeah? This, this will be also be very clear from the second study. So that they discovered as the grand narratives and then the little story about the counter narratives is this artist thing, the creative thing, but also the, the, how the diagnosis, there was a lot about labeling and diagnosis and that they say that it could also take the guilt away if, uh, if you are uh, bipolar psychotic, yeah, then you, you cannot really uh, account for everything you do because you're ill. Yeah, so it has this also this, um, uh, yeah, taking away the guilt. Yeah. Okay, so that was the first study. I don't know whether you have any questions about that. It was, it's really a nice thing to do actually, to, to just introduce little stories, uh, popular culture, about uh, mental illnesses and then to see uh, what the students do with that and to have them reflect on their own trained incapacities and to have them as much perspectives as possible. Um, yeah, it's, it's a nice thing to do actually. Yeah. Can I ask if there would be an advantage to compare different students so that you have a different... I mean, you can imagine that there's some overlap but some differences based on their is there a value to that for the research? Yeah, yeah, it would be interesting, I think. Because some of the things really are um, very specific, like the, the different therapeutic um, um, schools that we teach. But also, like in my class, because when Marine asked me, I said it's not very relevant, the class, but it is because my perspective on the DSM is very clear and it's, it's a way of labeling. And there is the, the question of is, it, is that true or not is for me not very relevant. The question is, is it useful or not? Yeah, because sometimes it's very useful to get a diagnosis because you get proper help. Yeah, sometimes it's not useful at all to get a diagnosis because then you have a label and okay. And that is something that they wrote down a lot of times. Yeah, so maybe when they're trained in a different way, yeah, it would be very interesting actually to see what they make and also like students not in psychology or maybe in psychiatry or, um, yeah, I do, I do think so. Of course, I guess the question that often arises, well, 
then you have to choose for action, or to act. You have to choose a perspective. Yes, yes. Yeah, that's also yeah, that's true, and it's it's something that we discussed a lot. And Burke also said that at a certain time, you cannot you can have different perspectives, but you, sometimes you have to do something and to choose one perspective. Yeah, but it's a it's a big difference if you choose one perspective, thinking that it's the only perspective, or if you choose one perspective, knowing that there are very different perspectives. Yeah, I, d I do think in, there's nothing against integration as long as you do not deny the, the, the difference. I, I mean, it's not that you just say, no, there is no difference or there are no different perspectives. There's ju just this one perspective that integrates everything. And integration can be very powerful, I think, but um, you have to also value all the, the underlying differences. Yeah, it's... Uh, um, it reminds me of, for instance, in teams, and so people are really sometimes afraid of being, of di to disagree. Yeah, it's there's no nothing wrong with disagreeing. Yeah, having different perspectives. It, it shouldn't always be integrated or compromised. Of course, if you value all the different perspectives, of course, then you can have something new coming up. Yeah, but that that requires that you value all. The, that you do not deny the underlying differences, I think. Yeah. If it's like this, I think we agree. Yeah. Okay. No. Does it mean that you don't have the solution? I don't have the solution. <laughs> but I do think that in... Um, in um, in a relationship between a psychologist or a psychiatrist and, and a client, there can be a good solution and a common perspective. I do think so. A usable solution. The best solution at that time. At that time, for that patient. And yeah, for that patient and that therapist in that time, in this environment, in this relationship, in this context. I do think, yeah, and that's true. There is, you have to do something, yeah? We have to value one perspective over the others. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. But that is not the. No, totally not. <laughs> it's something ironic huh? because it's the natural way to think is to believe there is a kind of imminent truth, but uh -huh. there is um, intrinsically good solution. Well, we know it is not true, but we cannot prevent ourselves yeah. uh, to think uh, uh, like that. Which, from an um, evolutive perspective, is kind of strange because it's really not adaptive to think like that. But we really naturally think like that. Yes, that's true. So maybe this it's conception in our brain. It, 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 but but I think we maybe it's like an existential perception that we do need the idea that there is one. That there is somewhere a good solution, no? Because otherwise, you have to motivate yourself every day again to to work with all these clients, no? I don't know. Maybe there is a, a lot of speculation too about how the brain of our ancestors was, was working. If you take, well, I'm fascinated by the end of mm -hmm. and uh, who had a bigger brain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe we can uh, also try to imagine other, other way to apprehend things. And I think that's why there are um, other approaches now in psychotherapy that are so popular. I think mindfulness touch a bit of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mindfulness is just trying to open your mind to all kinds of perceptions. And it's not even perspective. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's all kind of sensation, thoughts, and things like that, and not trying to do anything else with them, but just being aware. Yeah. And trying to use them. Uh, yeah. Maybe there is a. Um, yeah, absolutely. A, a different type of position that um, uh, we might cultivate together with our infinitely powerful and neurotic uh, <laughs> analytical brain. I think both are interesting. Absolutely.
things. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's nice because some of the things you say come back in uh, how mental health is portrayed in, in, in um, newspapers and magazines and popular things. That resonates, some of the things you say resonates there, so it's nice. Yeah. Shall we go on or do you want a break? A little break, five minutes. Five minutes? For me it's the same. <laughs> or otherwise we just continue and then we can stop whenever. Uh... You may decide. Eh? But, uh... You're still okay? Yeah. You're okay, let's go on. So the second one is the Van Beveren 2020 study we did in uh, different European countries. And this is about, this is uh, one of my favorites. It's um, about the grand narrative of the healthy citizen. Yeah. And so I remember in my talk, I said the grand narrative of the uh, family, the blood is taken from water. And here, here you have the grand narrative of the healthy citizen. And it's a combination of the enterprising self and the biomedicalization. I, uh... <laughs> um... You're being too offensive. <laughs> I'm sorry. The healthy citizen is a rational subject, so that's the grand narrative, yeah? We are all health, um, rational subjects. We manage, we manage the risk to develop a mental disorder, yeah? And every one of us, that risk, every one of us carries that, yeah? There is a kind of risk in every one of us that to have a mental disorder, but we take care of that, yeah? You have the self-help and the other help, and we are surrounded by people who help us, and if we have too much work, we take a break and blah, blah, blah. I ask you, do you want a break, yeah? Because I don't want you to panic or to get uh, whatever, yeah? We do that by a constant self-monitoring, yeah, this morning I did the self-test for the COVID. We, co we uh, monitor our infections. We monitor uh, a lot of things, yeah. Um, we, people have sleep uh, diaries and other diaries and, yeah. And uh, by, of course, making well-informed health and lifestyle decisions. Yeah, we eat healthy, we sleep enough, we exercise, we don't smoke, we... Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's the healthy set. That's the grand narrative. Yeah, and it's not difficult to find this grand narrative in the newspapers, in the magazines, and things like that. But of course, from a rhetorical perspective, we are not only looking for this, but also for a lot of counter narratives. Yeah, so that was the idea was to look in um, uh, different uh, European countries to have uh, during two weeks. All the uh, articles in the well-read newspapers and magazines, eh? uh, some for elderly, some for youth, some for all the different things, to look and to search for keywords on mental health and to see what are the narratives. So is there a grand narrative? But also, what are the potential counter-alternative or little narratives? Eh? We do an active search for different perspectives, the different deterministic screens, like Burke would say it. And so during two weeks, we screened the keywords in the most at newspapers and magazines. And that was in Cyprus, in Greece, in Belgium and the Netherlands, in Sweden and Norway. It's always two pairs of countries that are a bit comparable. And it's, we have a European um, project together. Okay, what we did is um, we did the coding in clusters just all, in every country, of course, because uh, I cannot read Greek and uh, Cyprus <laughs> and uh, also not uh, the Nordic languages. Huh? And then afterwards, when uh, we had the clusters, um, we did some more uh, in-depth analysis. Um, again, in two stages, inductively and deductively, to identify larger patterns and to gain deeper insights into the rhetorical strategies. What did you call the narrative? So the first thing was, what was the narrative about? And I will see, tell you there were four clusters. And then, what is the language used? What is the rhetorical, um, uh, the arguments made? What kind of um, symbols are using or the deterministic screens? Uh, things like that. 
So there are four clusters, and I will elaborate on these clusters. So the first is mental health in terms of danger and risk. It's more in the forensic uh, uh, section. Yeah, for instance, someone did a, uh, Will Smith. <laughs> it's probably ADHD or something. He cannot control himself, yeah, uh, because he slapped the other one on the, yeah. And, and you could also already read in, read in the newspaper because he had a hard time and he, with his wife and there was this movie and there was a lot of stress and blah, blah, blah. So this mental health in terms of danger and risk, yeah. The second one is a lifestyle issue. Yeah, you can all do from yoga to mindfulness to um, uh, all kind of uh, bark blossom therapies and things like that. Yeah, that are advocated in all kind of newspapers. Then you have the unique stories and experience, the the sufferers, the uh, people who tell that they overcome. Uh, for instance, I don't know you, whether you know her, but Sela Su, the, does that say you something? Yeah. She has a new album, it's a Flemish uh, singer, eh? and, and she has different personalities, and she, she has different songs about different personalities, and so she's very open about that she took pills before, and now she's no longer on pills, but then she has all this kind of uh, things going on. So it's telling about the unique story, yeah, and uh, experiencing, and then something about social trends is mainly about that the um, um, mental health is, uh, is not working, the uh, organization of mental, the mental health centers, there are long waiting lists and things like that. So these are the four different clusters. And then afterwards we did the rhetorical analysis and then you see that although these four clusters are very different things, they intersect a lot and there is not one single cluster that you can say this is like the good one, this destigmatizing. And this is the bad one, the stigmatizing, because they work in very different ways according to the context. Yeah? So we will end with intersectionalism and Heinde, yeah? the model that I started with, that you always have to see it in context. Yeah? That's what the rhetorical analysis tells us. But first, the different clusters. So the first one is um, the danger and risk. Yeah? This is clearly about the biomedical authority model and also the patient-consumer model. These are the two big models that we see. Yeah? Patient-consumer is about a self-entrepreneur. Yeah? You are a consumer, a client. You can uh, you manage your own risk. Yeah? And you have just have to know the, the, what works for you. Yeah? And it's in your own agency. And the biomedical one is, of course, about pharma and about it's something in the brain. We are our brains and things like that. Yeah. So a lot of news articles relate to mental health problems and criminal activities. Um, in this cluster, there were also a lot of uh, like on new research on mental health. It's, it's mainly about biomedical things, yeah, the, the neurological things that we know, eh? and it's also very much associated with risks, yeah, there's, if you have a car accident, there's a risk of that, or if you have something in your brain, then there's the risk of that, yeah. Uh, and the vision here is rather passive, yeah, it's just you undergo the risk, you are your brain, you cannot help it, yeah, um, and it's mainly before, um, for instance, in the criminal activities, um, there was no intentional motive. Someone just did it, yeah? Like the, here in the carnival thing, yeah? the, the one who uh, drove into the, the crowd, yeah? No motive, just happened, yeah? Um, a lot also about, I wasn't myself, I was someone else, yeah? Someone said I had to do that, uh, yeah? So the, the individual is rather or like the victim of your brain or your illness or whatever. Yeah? I couldn't control my impulses. Will Smith, yeah, Oscar, the slap on the face. Yeah. Interestingly, the mental illness is both the explanation why he slapped him on the face, yeah, and also the agent. It was not him. Yeah, it was the mental illness, yeah? So the agency is not in the person, but in the mental illness, yeah? and it's also the explanation for what happens. Yeah? But there is some individual responsibility 
For instance, in, cri in uh, crim crim criminal activities, judges or journalists would mention that the person did not seek psychological help, for instance. Yeah? We knew there was something going on. A lot of people said it was a strange person, but they never uh, uh, took any help yeah? or didn't take medication. Yeah? So there still is, and we will see that more in the lifestyle thing, there you have really that you are responsible, that you can take responsib full responsibility for your own mental health, and it's about seeking the right medication, seeking the right help. Yeah? But here, it's in intertwined. Yeah? You're a passive, it's a passive uh, stance for the individual, but still there is some individual responsibility. And so that was in all the different countries very clear. Yeah? The medical model is very strong here, um, and it's strange yeah, because, like I said, it's the explanation and the agent, so it's destigmatizing and stigmatizing at the same time. It's, uh, it's contradictory. Yeah? Uh, destigmatizing, it's taking away part of the blame and the guilt, yeah? because I wasn't myself. Yeah? There was no motive. I don't know what happened. But it's also stigmatizing uh, because there is something in that person. The person is wrong. The person is crazy. Yeah? And there's, he is his brains or she is her brains. Yeah? And this, you know, you remember that the biomedical model and the patient consumer model are the two main models. And this is also uh, present here in this cluster. Um, the reluctance to turn to professional help and the failure to, man to manage your own mental health. Yeah? Are, and also a lot about the economic costs, yeah? the economic, social, and human capital, and uh, about the costs of mental health problems. So this was the uh, first cluster. Oh, yeah, maybe not the terminology. It's a lot of different words actually used. You have the more judicial language, the accused, the offender. Yeah? You have the biomedical language, the psychiatric patient. And you have the language related really the madness, the disturbed one, eh, the sick mind. Yeah? So we have all these things together. Yeah? And then the concept of risk is also a lot mentioned. Um, and um, this is something that will also appear in the, I think, the third cluster. That is, there is this risk that is always there to the person, but also to society. Yeah? And we have to manage that. Yeah? And like I said, the grand narrative is really that every one of us carries a kind of risk and that we have to control it, that we have to manage it. Okay, so this is the first cluster. The second one is actively pursuing mental health. Yeah? This is really completely different. So the first was about risk and about more criminal things. Here it's about well-being, quality of life, happiness. Yeah? And we all pursue that eh, by healthy eating, healthy sleeping, by exercising, by responsible use of technology, you know, the social media, there are lots of articles about uh, too much social media and, and uh, how social media can be constructive and things like that. Yeah. Um, it inter intersects with the first cluster because um, the, it's still very individual. Yeah? It's only the fourth cluster who, who goes away from the individual. Yeah? And, but here, it's very much individual. Every one of us can pursue their own, we can all pursue our own happiness, well-being, quality of life, and it's actually a responsibility and even a duty yeah, to do that. And it's very uh, patient-consumer thing, yeah? the enterprising self, you are responsible for your own uh, happiness. It's not only a personal responsibility, but it's a lifelong commitment, yeah? It's not about dieting, it's about healthy eating, yeah? It's about healthy aging, it's about uh, um, sleeping and things like that. So it's really about, uh, so here's where the prevention for Stefan <laughs> comes in a lot. But I, I do think that in, in prevention, also there's four clusters really, prevention as a risk, yeah, as a danger, things, and then here as, as something that you have to pursue, happiness and things like that. It's completely different, yeah. The terminology here is the way of life, life attitudes, yeah, and um, in combination a lot with self. 
self-improvement, self-care, self-regulation. So it's very much the agency in the person. Yeah? So you see differences and similarities with the first cluster. Yeah? It's completely different, but it's also partly, and we will see in the rhetorical analysis, if you combine, sometimes they are combined, and then it's very complex. Hmm? The third one, these are really the little stories, like the, the graphic novel we talked about. Uh, it's about people telling their experience. Yeah? The um, uh, first person accounts, the knowledge by experience. Someone who was depressive and recovered, or someone who was addicted and recovered. And here the word story is an important word, like we say the little stories, eh, to describe the experiences of Sometimes it's about self, sometimes it's about a friend or a relative. I know someone, someone in my street. Yeah? It's something. Dealing with mental health problems, it's about stereotyping a lot, about stigmatizing. Um, and the story, the, really the word story is often uh, used, like everyone has, has their own story, or see the story behind the people. Yeah? So it's really subjective and personal. Yeah? It's the unique experience. Yeah. So the terminology here is very, di very different perspectives. It's very much referring to bodily, but also psychological, emotional, social dimensions. So it's all together. And there are also a lot of um, uh, potential sources of, su of support. And this is related to the self-made thing. Yeah? It's really, um, this is close to the cluster two. Yeah? So they often talk about, for me, what worked was that kind of pill, yeah? That kind of drug. Or having my friend, having a group with uh, sufferers, yeah? Uh, a group with people with the same experience, yeah? Or an alternative therapy, uh, whatever. So a lot of people um, giving their accounts of what worked for them, yeah? And the implicit idea is everyone can find somewhere the ideal therapy yeah, or the ideal way of being happy and things like that. You can all overcome your uh, difficulties. Yeah? What, you, what is really important here, and it's also in the conclusions, that there is far more references to mental health literacy than to mental health um, care. Yeah? It's more the idea of being literate, of, be, of knowing, yeah? If you know what's going on, if you know where to find help, if you know what works for you, you're okay. It's not about if we have good mental health organization, if we have professional, uh, that's not here. So the first person experience and also the, the, the cluster two, being literate, yeah? And I, that, that I also think about in prevention terms. We, we often stress this literacy, yeah? If you know, because the grand narrative is we are all rational, we know about the risk, and we behave accordingly, yeah? So if you make people literate, then it's okay. Of course, that's not how we look at it, yeah? But it's... Uh, it's very, so remember that this is how it's in the media, eh? how it's covered in all these different countries. Yeah? So that's the third. And the fourth one is mental health in social terms. This is completely different. It's the only cluster in which not the individual is the center of the uh, uh, um, media coverage, but it's about the system. Yeah? So there are things about the system, but it's often negative. The health system doesn't work. Yeah? Or professionals abuse power. Or um, there are not there are long waiting lists. Yeah? So it's the, the first two the three clusters is a lot about literacy, yeah, and about self-made and things. And here it's about professional organization, but <laughs> it's more often uh, how it and in Flanders now we have this minister, Baker, who is really under pressure because everything goes wrong from child education to elderly to everything. 
Yeah? So there's a lot of of what is going wrong in uh, mental health, health organization. Yeah? So critics on the organization of the healthcare system, sometimes by professionals and often by service users. Yeah? Um, also, a lot about societal trends, like um, the impact of um, high-pressure workplaces, uh, technological developments, again, social media, for instance, how it impacts on how we feel. You always have to be uh, ready to answer your mails. Uh, hey, the, there is no privacy anymore. And so, so the burnout, stress, anxiety, depression thing is also here. And it's social because it's not the individual, it's the high-pressure workplace. Yeah, It's the social media. So it's the, the, the thing of our society, the societal trends. And then also some about social inequalities and power differences um, and marginalized groups. Yeah. So the thing is, when it's about social things or professional organizations, it's often negative. Yeah. The terminology is very different. For instance, in the first three uh, clusters, we will we'll say about stigma. Here, it's about discrimination or violation of rights or social exclusion. Yeah, it's the social terminology. It's also about activism, advocacy, political awareness. It's not uh, about hearing and sharing stories. Yeah, it's about more the social thing. Yeah. So I think it's very interesting to see these four very different narrative, very different perspectives. Yeah. And they all complement, contradict, and whatever one another. And so if you see the, then the rhetorical analysis, the thing is, sometimes it was clearly one cluster. For instance, like the, the first person accounts or whatever. Yeah? But often it was intersected in several ways. Yeah? I, I just give some examples. Yeah? The dangerous and the risk, they often confirm the stereotypes of people with mental difficulties being out of control. Eh? But also in a lot of first person accounts, this was mentioned, yeah, of being out of control and then seeking the right help. So and the danger, and it, I wasn't myself, so I, the, the, the agency is in the mental illness versus I was out of control, but I did manage to get help and the right help, and I did it myself. Yeah, sometimes contradicted. Yeah, it's a contradiction, and sometimes in one article. Yeah, so you give the message of destigmatizing and the counter message of stigmatizing. Because if if you are able to find the right help and you not, and you do a crime, yeah, then it's your. Fault. But it's not your fault because it you wasn't yourself. Yeah, so it's. It's very uh, contradictory in one account, yeah? And there are lots and lots of examples of that. Another one is the biomedical mental illness is a disease like any other, yeah? the health, the health uh, the lifestyle uh, version. So it's like the prevention of cancer or heart disease. You can also, it's also the prevention of depression and burnout, yeah? Just take care of yourself and you're okay. Um, that's often used to normalize mental, mental illness because if you, can take, if you can get the right therapy by taking the right pills or get, go, going to a self-help group or whatever, so it's normalizing. Everyone can have a burnout. Everyone can have a depression. Huh? But on, and it's often about uh, having the right pills, yeah, pharmacology. But however, we know, and this is about what I said about literacy, that the more literate people are, it doesn't mean that there are less stigmas. Yeah? Because it's not about knowing. Yeah? It's something very different. Yeah? So there is a lot of emphasis on the biomedical model and about um, uh, having the right treatment. And it's just like any other disease. Yeah? Even today, we have this in, in Flanders, this actress. She's very famous. She's very funny. Um, I, I forgot her name, but she was in, um, uh, oh, I forgot her, but she's very funny, and the, the people who watch Flemish television know her, um, but she had an alcohol uh, addiction, yeah? and today in the newspaper was with her, uh, a photo of her with her two uh, children saying, we were not mad at our mother because we knew she was ill, yeah? So having this illness 
as and so she couldn't she yeah was just so it really interacts in in very different ways another one is all these clusters together the uh, expertise by experience for instance intersected with the consumerism so the self entrepreneurship um, and uh, also with individualization uh, um, often social problems are individualized and yes then you get this really uh, strange idea of empowerment yeah because on the one hand you're ill you couldn't you're not responsible for that but you're responsible for having the, the good treatment so what is empowering then knowing yeah instead of having the right mental health organization yeah so there's the autonomy of making choices and the responsibility to make the right choice yeah it's your responsibility you have to look and if you're well informed, you can have the exact good treatment for you. Yeah. So they prioritize mental health literacy over mental health services, like I said. Yeah. It's a lot about that. In the, although we know that it's not about mental health literacy alone. Yeah. And maybe a last one is um, also very, very interesting one. Yeah. Um, the mental health problem in a lot of the first person accounts is part of who you are like in the graphic novel also Alan she is a creative person it's part of who she is the bipolar depression it's part of who she is but on the other hand it's something that we have to um, uh, treat to be the real self yeah she isn't herself like in a crime they aren't themselves yeah because of the mental illness yeah so the mental illness is something part of the identity and at the same time something that we have to treat to see the real self you see also this contradiction so there's lots of contradictions in all this uh, although the, the four clusters I think are really um, clear and all different narrative and different perspectives they interact in so complex ways that it's very uh, hard to say what the effect will be of all this narratives on the event. So the conclusion... Hmm? But here, complexity seems to blur our ability to understand the situation and to act in what you present here. So it's a little bit contradict Nietzsche claim. Well, I do think that we... Uh, that, that is what, what we say. The conclusion is that there's nothing unambiguously positive, destigmatizing or stigmatizing. Yeah, it really depends on the context, the specific account that you want to make. And so it's, I don't, I, I think that the conclusion is that there is no single way or single narrative that is positive for everyone or that is good for everyone or that is liberating for everyone. There's also no single narrative that is oppressive for everyone. Yeah, it's, it really depends on what context it is and how you present it yeah and so i do think that we have to be more aware of what the impact could be yeah more than that we have to look for the right perspective yeah or the the best perspective so and in this way i do think it's very rhetorical because all the all the different perspectives they all have their power their their oppressive and liberating things yeah and there is no single perspective that is more valuable than the other i think at least that is the conclusion i think that that we can and so we come actually where we started in the inaugural talk with this model of hindi where, where we say that yeah, that's always in, within interactions, within relationships, within context. Yeah, and also intersectionality and discourse dependency. It really depends on how these all intersect and how the discourse is. And 